Tell me which genre of music this is. Country music, right? All right, what about this one? It is a little bit country, but softer. This is called, aptly, modern folk music. Folk music, country music, Americana, and all surrounding subgenres are inextricably linked to the white Scottish heritage of the Appalachian Mountains and Deep South. But like everything, there are exceptions to this rule. What if I told you that the same music that spawned country and folk also spawned this? Reggae, a genre that originated in Jamaica in the 60s, deeply linked to the Afrocentric religion Rastafari, at its core promotes Pan-Africanism. So how does reggae relate to folk music from the American South? The answer is in a shared root, a celebratory world dance music that developed from a book of common hymns and church singing. In Jamaica, this became a style known as mento, these same hymns were also sung in the rural South and Appalachia in Gospel, Baptist, and Anglican churches. But when taking these songs outside of the church and applying their own unique culture, these songs came to be what we now know as folk and country music. This remarkably similar process with the same hymns when applied to diverse cultures produced something completely different. So if you ask a reggae artist today if they have anything in common with country music or vice versa, you wouldn't likely hear a lot of shared commonalities. Fast forward to the 21st century. Country music and reggae is everywhere and have spawned their own genres and subgenres that have their own rules and traditions, even if all these subgenres share the same roots. But the farther we get away from our shared roots, the more we're faced with a certain gatekeeping that keeps artists who approach the genre left on the outside of this culture due to nothing more than who they are. The country music industry has a checkered history of gatekeeping, racism, and homophobia, but still has inspired groups of artists of all backgrounds and genders to create new and exciting country music. The most recent famous example of this is Lil Nas X. Now, you're probably familiar with Old Town Road. Released in 2019, it initially charted on both the Billboard Country and Hot R&B Hip Hop charts in March of that year. However, Billboard then quietly removed the song from the Hot Country chart for, quote, not enough elements of today's country music, end quote. Okay, let's unpack that. This exclusion brought criticism of the work of non-white and non-cisgendered artists not being considered for traditionally non-black and non-cisgendered genres and subgenres. Now I know that sounds like a mouthful. What was being said, without explicitly being said of course, was that hip hop, R&B, dance, electronica, and reggae, these were the domains of black and non-cisgendered artists, whereas country, rock, even folk and Americana, these were genres specifically for white people. To his credit, Lil Nas X responded to the criticism in stride, saying, quote, I believe whenever you're trying something new, it's always going to get some kind of bad reception. Of course, Lil Nas X has gone on to be one of the most popular artists on the globe, a leading figure in the music industry, a voice for queer and non-binary artists around the globe, and when it comes to Old Town Road, 
Well, after all that, it ended up charting on Billboard's country airplay chart. Anyway. It's funny how we can associate such strong ideas when just pondering one or two genres. As more emerging artists take the stage, we're faced with a critical moment to examine music classification systems that exist. And like in many things, they were designed to help categorize. But what if these rigid systems are actually stifling artists? Like many systems and models that were originally created to keep order, there is an archaic nature that haunts the pillars of these old models. When it becomes about prejudice and discrimination standing between art and emerging voices, I invite you now to reevaluate and think a little more critically about how we can adapt to our current landscape. Queer artists in country music have a long-standing tradition in the art form. I'm your host, Laura mckinnis Ray, and in this episode of Beneath the Rhythm, we interviewed Shana golden Pershbacher, author of the new book, Queer Country. In it, she examines the challenges of queer and non-binary artists today, and the artists whose shoulders upon which they stand those from the 70s who used country music as a springboard in expressing their sexuality and ultimately subverted the normative country music standard. We also interviewed Ray Spoon, a Canadian country music singer and author who, as a trans artist themselves, have firsthand experienced the challenges of writing and performing country music for an audience that may not always accept them for who they are. I'm Shana golden Pershbacher. I'm Assistant Professor of Music Studies at Temple University. How did you decide to focus on country and queer country? Absolutely. It didn't, you know, it's an interesting story because, um, especially to talk about right now, in this moment in which queer country's exploding, you know, Little Nas X, Brandy Carlisle, people know, uh, you know, Trixie Mattel, people know who these artists are. There's press around them. You know, there's even a, a, ma- a sort of online magazine devoted to queer country called Country Queer, which is terrific. But when I started this project, there was nothing like that. I didn't have a lot to go on. I didn't even know who was out there, right? Because some people weren't out and they still aren't. There weren't articles about top 10 queer country artists you need to know about, you know. I wasn't even sure if I should call it country. I debated that heavily throughout the whole project, going back and forth around folk, Americana, alt country, country roots. And I think that what happened for me is that I was interested As a graduate student, I was interested in identity and music, especially for people whose identities made it difficult for them to fit into a genre. And I wondered why that was and what was going on with the sort of social and musical boundaries of genre that had to do with identity categories and how are changing notions of identity categories might affect these people's careers. And so I've always been interested in musicians, regardless of the level of success and fame they have, because I'm interested in how people's careers have been affected by some of these very real boundaries and barriers. So I went to that concert I describe in the introduction. I was expecting I guess I was expecting drag queens lip syncing and humor, biting satire. And instead, I found this earnest queer group of musicians who were political and charming and a little bit dorky and sort of on the border between a bunch of genres. They called themselves vocal harmony folk pop. They didn't know what to call themselves, and that proved to be a problem for them. The country part of the project chose me in a way. And based on this group that really wasn't at all part of country, I sort of worked my way in, figuring out that the questions I was really interested in around sincerity, around the kind of deep meanings of America, around journey and morality, and around the gatekeeping of musical genre, that led me into country and some of the some of the genres that 
border country. So sort of define themselves against country or in relation to such as alternative country, which is now called Americana. I found one of the most interesting things you brought up, even just the similarities between genre and gender as words and sort of understanding even the aesthetic or at least the constructed aesthetic around both of those things. We know we understand, and at least in a marketing perspective, that there should be categories for things to keep things equal or categorical, and I guess just to keep order. And I think one of the biggest themes that you are exploring in this book is that doesn't mean that it's applicable anymore. Mm. Um, and we need to adapt to the music industry and the social landscape that we're actually living in now. And it's and it's not that. So. Right. You know, when you're describing essentialism and how to be an artist and actually dive into an industry that's already not on your side, and then suddenly you have this decision to make about where your identity fits into your sound or genre. So I, f- I found that I've, I've never thought of something that way where I think about genre and I think about the artist's even when I'm explaining or telling friends about someone I've heard and I liked. And I didn't realize how polarizing that conversation could be in just one sentence, really. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And I think, you know, I think that part of the use of the utility of genres simply to find things in a world with a lot of music or, you know, in any kind of category like that, you know, or even for people to anticipate something about that. Like, is this going to be soothing? Is it going to be thrilling? Or is it something to dance to? You know, so in those ways, that makes sense. But as I've been teaching in my popular music courses at Temple, the history of genre in American popular music goes back to this very racist moment in the early days of the record industry in which Um, Southern music was categorized between race records, which were records featuring African-American musicians and intended to sell to African-American listeners, or hillbilly records, which were meant to be poor white people from rural areas intended to sell to actually increasingly white migrants from the South who worked in industry and cities um, and were sort of lonesome for that rural sound. And we've inherited those categories and their legacies are very much with us today. So we have these genres like urban contemporary, you know, it's a race record category. Country music is the descendant of this hillbilly concept, although country has definitely wrestled with that term, which is derogatory. Yeah, I've learned about this through um, some incredible scholars, Carl Hagstrom Miller's book, Segregated Sound, Elijah Wald's scholarship on Robert Johnson and the blues. I knew that this was a charged category. I also knew from my prior work, looking at someone like Michelle Indegio Cello, who is an incredible musician, who is a bass player and singer-songwriter. She's Black, she's bisexual. Her music doesn't quite fit in any category. And she's she's really had to struggle with that in the music industry. And some of the language around it has centered on her identity rather than her musical sound or what they expect of her sound based on how she looks or how she identifies. So I knew that was going to be something worth looking into. Definitely a reason to poke around in a genre like country music, which historically has been entirely unwelcoming to out gay and lesbian musicians and definitely is still very difficult for transgender musicians. It makes me think of when you uh, talked about Patrick Haggerty and the time that you spent working with him as an artist that became an icon so much later in his career, and yet being so iconic for the community that he was speaking to the entire time. This sort of catch-22. How, how would you describe that phenomenon as the thing keeping you from becoming successful is the thing that you're now becoming successful for? Exactly. Like what, what kind of... How do we even... Call- how do we explain sort of in a social commentary what that 
is. I mean, so what does he call it? I mean, he has a term for it himself, the sort of like the dialectic, like that, you know, the very thing that kept him out of country music, his out gay and Marxist kind of agenda, very explicitly expressed in his singular album from 1973, Lavender Country, shuns him from the entire industry. They only released a thousand records. They all sold because he knew that gay people were hungry for connection with other gay people. And that, you know, this whole, this whole sort of Stonewall generation was an intersectional activist generation that was just dying for change, literally. They were partnering to to fight racism, to fight sexism, to fight homophobia, to fight the medicalization of some of these groups of people, to work towards more just economic sort of situation through Marxism. And yet, as he says, he had to pick a different career after he released that album. It just was not possible to in any way market himself as country music. He knew that that choice was important because it felt authentic. It was a way to deliver music and political message and personal stories that felt true to him and would bring true to listeners because they knew to to sort of expect from country music a reliable story, something meaningful. And then at the same time, this kept him out of the industry until this incredible moment in 2014 when his music has been put on YouTube by someone he didn't know. He didn't even know really what YouTube was. He was 70 years old and and these guys from Paradise of Bachelors called this two straight cisgender men who are lovely and doing really cool work sort of re-releasing archival records that will be more salient, you know, now than they maybe were it, when they were originally released um, with like extensive newly c- composed liner notes explaining who this person is and, you know, why their record is so incredible. He thought it was a joke, you know, when they called. But the culture had changed so much and country music had shed some of its connections to regular people, at least in the ears of some of the musicians and some of the listeners. They felt like country music was really had sold out, had had become desperate for listeners and wasn't authentic anymore. I mean, this is a word I use in scare quotes because, you know, I think everyone has their own understanding about what authentic music is. I don't think there's one real true answer there. But, but suddenly the straight musicians in country music saw Patrick Haggerty and his earnest courageous message from the 70s as really inspiring. And they were thrilled that he was still alive and able to come on tour and collaborate. And suddenly, somebody who had never altered his message to sell to a mainstream audience that the record industry feared um, would reject the politics of his message or even just see his identity itself as political. You know, he had never compromised that. He had refused to. And he he um, was unemployed because of that. But suddenly that turned around and it was the very thing that made him so desirable for collaborations. And many of the people that collaborated are are straight cisgender men, which is a really interesting moment. I think that, you know, the election of Donald Trump as president has a lot to do with it, as well as this kind of, you know, moment in the uh, mainstream country industry in which there's kind of a fear about the listeners that maybe they're going to reject some of these politics. I think a lot of the people in the industry that Patrick met, they're unhappy. They feel like they have to, they have to hide their beliefs or their identifications. Mm -hmm. You know, that many people in the industry are progressive, are accepting of lots of people. And yet the industry itself, the people who run it, choose 
which music makes it onto mainstream country radio, which is still a key place if you're going to be a star in that genre, they're, they limit um, the message. curated. Yes, exactly. Or policed, I guess you could say <laughs> right. as well. Yes. Curated is, is a very kind word for that, yes. <laughs> there was a quote you included when you were talking to Canadian musician Ray Spoon, and you mentioned how they were speaking about if you come see me at a bar or a restaurant or, you know, a venue that I wouldn't typically consider kind to trans musicians or trans folk, but you still did and you're still listening to my music. Absolutely. And I think that that really speaks to the way that the music industry exploits musicians, that we as listeners sometimes enjoy and feel entertained by a wide variety of musicians, especially those that have been pigeonholed by identity categories and then encouraged to exaggerate those in a performance for our consumption. And so Mm -hmm. we we as listeners may feel comfortable consuming some of this, um, especially the sort of exaggerated stereotypes. And here I'm thinking about the history of blackface minstrelsy in the U.S., the most popular form of entertainment for a hundred years is white people costuming themselves as if they were black and performing these horrible derogatory and very false stereotypes. And we've inherited these problems. So I think people are used to consuming music performed by somebody who's in a very marked identity category that may not be part of that listener's everyday life in other ways. They may not have other relationships with people who would identify themselves that way. But um, I think that Ray Spoon is really calling on listeners to think about that. I think Ray Spoon has had a hard time with some of these issues. Canada has fewer music venues. So one thing that Spoon says about that particular issue of playing in these venues is that these are the only venues that exist there. So you're going to play the same place that all the other musicians are playing. The same people are going to come to these shows because things aren't so marked the way they are in the U.S., where there's a punk venue and, you know, a musical Mm -hmm. theater venue and, you know, those two don't mix. You know, their audience probably doesn't mix. Spoon has been brilliant at attracting listeners and kind of seducing them to think in a more compassionate way through their music, through their storytelling, which includes um, several really brilliant and very accessibly written personal books, um, nonfiction, and an incredible documentary. And those things wouldn't have been produced without um, help from uh, Canadian grants, yeah, they they managed to to help some of these folks relate to a person who otherwise might seem very different. And so, in that way, I think their music and storytelling has been so important, um, even when it's been extremely challenging touring in some of these places, um, identifying as transgender. I mean, Spoon has reflected back on some of those experiences and felt like it was unsafe at the time. And the, and I think it's also, you mentioned this as well, and I've, I've read many articles about this, speaking with trans artists where they say that it's better to ask or even make a mistake than to just assume but that's almost like the part, the discomfort that comes with it, with accepting something that you don't understand yet mm-hmm. or that isn't. It's this sort of thing where people are afraid, so they just ignore it or right. they just think that it'll go away. And I think yeah. we're coming to this realization where that's not OK and it's better to move. How else are we going to move forward other than to be uncomfortable for a little bit? Because it's been... A, Sure as hell been uncomfortable for them for long enough. (laughs) Right, exactly. I mean, that's an interesting point where I think that cisgender people who are trying to be understanding and compassionate are trying to be polite in that moment by not pointing at this issue of gender identification and binaries. I think that that's where that comes from, not asking in a way, um, is just being considerate. I think that trans folks have taught us that 
it's better to ask. It's also better for us as cis people to share our pronouns so that it's not something that stigmatizes trans people, but that it's something that we all discuss and sort of show that we've chosen pronouns. So I, I wanted to ask you, after diving into this, because you've obviously worked in, in research and teaching for a long time, it takes a lot of effort and critical <laughs> thinking to even decide what gets included. What are you most proud of about writing about or putting out into the world once this is published? Thank you for acknowledging the hard work. It was um, it was so intense working on this book. Part of it I did to myself by going to, I don't know how many concerts and listening to as many um, recordings as I could get my hands on. I bought every CD and LP and MP3 that I could get my hands on. I didn't start writing until 2014. So I'd been listening for about 10 years and mulling things over and talking to people, transcribing my interviews. But the mistake I made was not to <laughs> not to start writing sooner. So I had in my head just, you know, swirling with all of these stories, all of these songs that stood out to me for different reasons. Part of my research method is to kind of listen to some of my gut instincts. You know, when a song is swirling around in my head and I can't stop thinking about, you know, how interesting it is, I know it's calling out to me to be discussed. The same thing happens when I have conversations with musicians or with listeners. I have a good memory. And so certain phrases and certain anecdotes certain opinions will stand out to me as memorable about that interview and something that my ear caught on to because it was part of the theory that I was formulating. And one thing that makes my book special, if I can claim that, is that I formulated my theory based on my interviews and my historical study and my listening. So rather than, I, I read lots of I've read lots of other scholars' books. I have a huge library. I'm obsessed <laughs> with other people's books and digging into their smart ideas. However, I decided for this that the way to honor these musicians and their courageous, brilliant work and the complicated history, you know, and politics that they've been dealing with was to formulate my theory based on their experiences. That meant that I really needed that wide body of research. I needed to sit with that and kind of write in notebooks and scribble around and try to make maps and stuff. But it was a really messy, long, and stressful way of doing it for a first book that I'm <laughs> relying on for my tenure case, or I'll lose my job. Um, so <laughs> it was hard. And especially in this moment when queer country has just exploded into the mainstream. I mean, it was very difficult to stop writing because everything was so exciting and overwhelming. It was suddenly becoming visible and audible to regular people who before had asked me what I do and just been like, really? There are, there are LGBT country musicians? Why would they pick that genre? Like, how did you even get involved in country? People used to ask that all the time. And then suddenly people were like, oh yeah, queer country. I mean, they knew the phrase even. I mean, it became so obvious what I should title my book. Whereas before I was struggling with what to even call this. It just, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a kind of coming together um, and understanding societally of what this is and why it's valuable. I raced to finish basically because, you know, it was time. But yeah, I think I'm proud of that. I'm also proud because I had to build an archive for this research. I couldn't just go to the Beethoven archive and sift through you know, a musician's papers and all of their scores and recordings and um, read all of the books about that particular musician. In this case, there really wasn't much published about any of these musicians. Katie Lang was one exception, and I read nearly everything published about her, and that was fantastic to be able to engage with. Many of these musicians, there wasn't even journalism about them. I have really loved working with journalism. I basically would talk to musicians and try to find out 
who else they suggest I work with, you know, and think about. And it's, you know, sort of a delicate issue, right? Because Obviously, there's plenty of queer and trans people in the country and related industry, but not all of them are out to their listeners. I had to follow a circuitous route. There wasn't an obvious way to go for a long time. I met some musicians that were very sort of much on the margins of these genres um, and were struggling to make a career and, you know, eventually met some who became central in this music and figured out, oh, you know, there's some incredible mainstream people who have forged careers with a relationship to country, but really in folk and folk rock, like Amy Ray of the Indigo Girls, who's an incredible country musician as well and has a terrific band. So that helped to figure out and to have this anxiety that I felt around, you know, can I call this country? I realized, Mm -hmm. oh, well, this is the same thing the musicians are dealing with, this sort Mm -hmm. of, um, this instability of their own musical category was exactly what I needed to write about. I didn't need to feel nervous myself for calling it that. It was more about exploring that very fear that we all had. Like, there's a lot of gatekeeping for this genre, and this is exactly this the space that I need to write about. So that was really key to understanding how to write this book. When I was first reading the synopsis, before I started actually cracking the book open, I was I was thinking, okay, so this will be like a commentary and, you know, an ethnography on the changing political landscape of like trans and queer country artists. And even in that sentence, once I started reading and I'm, you know, I'm swirling around that idea in my head, I thought, well, no, it's not because it's not only just country and it's also not, you're also talking about a landscape even before it was changed or something actually progressed or developed. So <laughs> It was just this interesting uh, realization where I had a certain idea about what topic you would be covering. And then when I actually dug in, I realized it was because I didn't know much. Right. Some of these people from earlier and also that um, queerness was a topic that some country songs addressed, um, although often homophobically, you know, um, Mm -hmm. or transphobically. Um, This already was an idea that country music would engage with at times. Yeah, these musicians have entered into a music that's already um, situated them in some ways, Mm -hmm. often negatively. I decided to go back farther. I kept finding things, so my timeline kept changing and sort of my vision of this in terms of who was alive to talk to, um, and what their opportunities were like. So yes, I'd love to follow up on some of these stories. One of the things that was hard about this book was having, having uh, I guess, a limitation of space and a desire for some coherence there with my with the themes that I had developed, which meant that I left out musicians and songs and stories that mm-hmm. that are so incredible. The other thing that was hard about this book was, you know, there are a couple people who are not really out and their music's been incredibly influential, but I felt that it was definitely not my place to, to out them. And so that meant that my book might not pay tribute to them in the way that I feel that they deserve. As you continue, you know, your research and your experiences, I'm sure you'll have enough material to we're part of something, we're part of a movement. This is a phenomenon that's changing. We're not stuck in a stagnant place for a good reason. Hopefully there'll be more and more and more of these events, key events. Um, There'll be more and more explosions like Lil Nas X that are sort of trailblazing for new fans, for new communities, for new artists as well. Um, And maybe it'll be safe for some of these, um, you know, most famous and successful country musicians to, you know, be a little more clear about their identity. And, you know, it, it's certainly a um, <laughs> an urgent moment in our culture around these identifications and around, you know, huge political battles. So I can't predict what's going to happen and whether it'll be safe for them to come out. Who knows? I could have a a, a revised second edition of the book where I include them. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. 
It's hard to predict who's coming next in terms of these huge explosions. Some of these musicians who are gay men, who I close the book with, in some ways are are opening doors, I think, that that the trans musicians might be able to have a foot in because right now it's quite difficult to be a transgender country-related musician, um, whereas Trixie Mattel and Orville Peck and Little Nas X are having enormous success. And I think their music could simply sort of continue along the kind of male privilege line, but I think that they're all really pushing it. They realize that they can help. Um, so I think they may be doing more advocacy work in their kind of play with gender and their relationship to politics as they gather more mainstream audience members. Mm -hmm. That's my hope anyway. And certainly I check in with Patrick regularly about this because some of these musicians continue to work with him. So Orville Peck asked him to open on the tour this fall and it didn't work out because Patrick has to assemble a band based on geography. It's too expensive to fly everyone from Seattle. He has some musicians on the East Coast. He has other musicians in the middle of the country. So it didn't work out, but he was sort of like, you know, this is an interesting moment for me politically, right? Because mm -hmm. I I see Orville Peck as someone who has the same political convictions that I do about the world, about justice. And he also is in this moment of stardom, and access to an unbelievable audience, a huge audience. And so with that comes these pressures to kind of tone things down and conform, at least it has in the past. Um, we'll mm -hmm. see, you know, I think one of the things that's been freeing for him is the, he doesn't have any um, responsibility to country music. He doesn't need them. He uses the sound and image, but does so through, through like, you know, kind of indie alternative rock sounds and audiences and venues. So mm -hmm. that's that's key. And I think that's that's also true of Little Nas X and Trix Trixie Mattel. So Little Nas X, after that initial Old Town Road, you know, is it country or not kind of debate, scandal, censorship has released music that I think is categorized as hip hop. He, he's never needed the country music industry. And that's been kind of funny all along. You know, he's such a brilliant kind of mastermind of social media and, you know, the, the argument and humor and timing of how he releases things. He always wins. So, you know, he doesn't need them and their gatekeeping. And Trixie Mattel, at the same time as, you know, some country music fans have really appreciated her music you know it's it's been seen as authentic in some of these interesting old-fashioned country music ways that Richard Peterson the sociologist wrote about in his brilliant book um, creating country music uh, crafting fabricating authenticity um, it's a terrific book about sort of the ways that country music tells a story of itself as authentic but actually that uh, authenticity is fabricated no matter what it is whether it's the hillbilly, mountaineer, old timer, sort of mm -hmm. barefoot sitting on your porch playing the banjo, or whether it's the more glossy studio produced Nashville sound, you know, either way, these things have always, they've been created and the sort of mythology around them has, is a product. It's not, it's not really tied to this music and, and yeah, but Trixie, you know, plays with all of that, you know, with some of this like acoustic songs about, you know, struggle that are that are resonant, right? Like the creator of Saving Country Music talks about this moment in which a gay man's suffering marks his country music as authentic in a moment when this music has lost some of the <laughs> connection to human struggle and pain and poignancy that marked it in its creation and its history. It's a very interesting moment. But yeah, Trixie Mattel also doesn't need them. Um, you know, she's got a cosmetic line and a New York Times, you know, number one selling book and, you know, a TV series. So the music sales are just kind of the cherry on top. Yeah, we can't we can't forget about the commercialization of 
of music when we're discussing music industry. It's like kind of the the harsh reality sometimes where you have to try and remove that from why do you like it um, or why is it accessible to you? And, you know, especially for a lot of artists that have teams, right. entire teams behind them, like there is a, there's been a lot of time and effort and resources that have gone into making it uh, something that you enjoy listening to. That's not applicable to everything, obviously. But right. No, in but the it, mainstream. <laughs> right. It's definitely kind of hidden and it's something that, is interesting about popular music scholarship. I think, it, you know, it, it's true of all kinds of music. I suppose that's one place where ethnography as well as kind of historical research helps uncover some of that. Even just looking at who designed those clothes or, yeah. you know, who's taking your photos? You know, what's your relationship to the journalist who's writing this story? And how did you get that venue? You know, even just trying to book a venue myself in Philly for for some of these artists, I ran into some of these issues and was like, oh, right, like I don't have the connections and I'm not telling the right story here. But it's interesting, you know, who I ended up with and why. I mean, the Philadelphia Mausoleum of Contemporary Art, which is is an old mausoleum turned into a performance space. And, you know, it's all about alternative, radical music that's going to attract a young, hip audience, a kind of punk audience who wants music that's powerful and, you know, speaking their truth and angry and accessible. Um, Mm -hmm. And all of these bands are that. They don't have that team. They're booking these shows themselves, whereas some other people, they've had to navigate that. I mean, one interesting case is Shelley Wright, who was a mainstream country star when she was closeted. And once she came out, country music cut her off. And so for the last decade, she's been trying different things. She has been an Americana musician. um, And recently she's been um, a DEI corporate employee um, working on issues of diversity and equity in the corporate workplace. And she's just recently gotten signed again. So, you know, maybe she's riding this tide here of new acceptance of queer country. And we'll see if this time the mainstream country industry accepts her in any way, because that's really where she wants to be. She's not happy in Americana. That's not exactly her music. That's a really good example. And this has been a really wonderful conversation. And I like reading the book has opened my eyes in a lot of different ways and also exposed me to a lot of artists that I hadn't heard of and some familiar ones as well, which I was like happy to see, see in there and be part of the conversation. Um, So it's definitely opened my eyes in a different way. So it's been a it's been a pleasure getting insight from, you know, the creator, the person who made this all possible. So I really commend you for putting, you know, a story out like that or not a story because it's nonfiction, but kind of like a new narrative out there that coming out when there's a, a gap in this in reading and in journalism, as you said before. So it's been really wonderful to read. So I just really appreciate you coming in and having a conversation with us. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really honored um, to have this attention for my book and eager to hear what what readers and listeners think. Um, I'm so glad to have these musicians get a wider audience and to have people pay attention to not only the incredible skill and creativity and poignance of their music, but Mm -hmm. in the context of this history of country music, of popular music in North America, their courage in in crafting and releasing this music and continuing to perform it to a variety of audiences who they don't know how they're going to react. I I feel lucky that they trusted me with their with their stories and that I was able to showcase their music. I also I wanted to ask when is the book releasing next year? February 15th. Apparently there are uh, widespread delays in the publishing industry, I think due to paper shortages. <laughs> And so oh, I've God. been biting my nails about this a little bit because it's it's totally beyond my control. So I think what you read is probably the page proofs that 
I hadn't yet corrected. So I've since gone through every single word of the book, made little changes, um, improved certain things. Clarity is always so just urgently important to me. I want a wide readership. You know, I don't want this to be an inaccessible academic book that only a limited audience can understand any of. Um, so Patrick Haggerty actually read it, you know, <laughs> which was great for him to give me feedback on what what resonated for him and, mm -hmm. you know, what parts I could make more clear. But yeah, so February 15th is when it's going to be available. I brought Ray Spoon to Calgary for um, a popular music conference. And I realized that was a sensitive issue because they're alienated from their own family. And so what's it like to come back home? Um, is that tense? Do people get in contact, you know, do family members get in contact in an uncomfortable way? I mean, um, that's, that's a difficulty of, you know, being an ethnographer, um, is, is navigating situations like that and wondering, you know, at the same time, I'm trying to promote this musician and, you know, their terrific work. Am I putting them in, in danger or in an uncomfortable position? It's such a lonely thing writing a book. I mean, it's just years of struggle, you know, and just pouring over sentences and theories and wondering, have I represented that person accurately? Or like, mm -hmm. like losing sleep because somebody's gotten left out of the narrative. Um, and, and yeah, to finally have it out is surreal. I mean, it's just, you know, having other people read it and, and be interested and enjoy it is just, um, an enormous relief and very gratifying. Should I be a man or a woman? What does that really mean? Should I be outside of it or something in between? Do whatever the heck you want. Do so as, as you know, uh, you upon want. reading uh, Queer Country by Shana Golden Pershbacher. Um, we were delving into, you know, exploring some of the recurring themes she discussed in the book, uh, specifically surrounding um, identity politics in the queer and trans music community. And, you know, just overall how that relates to country music and the music industry and how we can challenge these sort of outdated gender and genre constructs to be more inclusive um, in the public arena. So um, you are one of the key players Shana interviews and talks and references um, when describing trailblazers in the queer and trans music community and uh, really just wanted to focus in on sort of your journey and your story. And specifically, there was a quote um, that you said when you said, how do you become a transgender country singer? For some, it's easier to be transgender from the start and then work towards becoming a singer. And for others, it's better to play music first and then come out as transgender. About 10 years, I managed to do both in the space of a few months. Um, I was hoping you could tell us more about your background leading up to, you know, that statement and your current music career. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I um, I guess you know I I I kind of came out as transgender right around when I was starting to become more heavily involved, like with making country music. So uh, I guess it was too. I moved away from Calgary. I grew up in Calgary, which is a city. Um, you know, a lot of my experiences with my family are rural, and a lot of my family are basically like yeah, very working class on both sides. And um, I didn't really know where I was from until I moved. So I wasn't so into country music when I lived in, you know, in Calgary. I, it was all around me, right? Um, and then when I moved to Vancouver, which is more like a West Coast city, more like Portland or, you know, it started to like pop up. So I moved when I was 19 um, from Calgary to Vancouver. And, yeah, and I was already out as queer. You know, I came out in high school as queer in Calgary in the 90s, which was really not that fun. But, um, you know, and then I kind of came to Vancouver for that more open more open openness to queerness and and I met like the first trans people I'd ever met and you know I've always had to kind of see that someone else was doing it like if identified as something to see it as a possibility so you know as soon as I realized I could you know be a identify as a gender other than being the one I was assigned like female from birth 
um, yeah, it felt like that fit. So, yeah, I kind of came into that in this, and also realized I was missing home and started to write more, like, you know, about home. And it sort of turned into into country music. And, and I did that for, yeah, about five or ten years and, like, something like that. And, and then I eventually, you know, the industry of it, I... I had to give up on it. Like I, I left it and started making more electronic and rock. And you know, I don't think I'm not country now. I think you can't really take that out of your voice. But um, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, my faith in that part of the industry is, I still don't really want to be involved <laughs> in it. You know, <laughs> like um, I, it's like I'm. I mean, I've been seeing some really great like improvements now. You know, like with Will Nas X, and then I have another friend who, uh, Allison Russell, who's playing like roots music and and she's like mm-hmm. black and she's getting awesome like reviews in the rolling stone and you know so i'm seeing like that country folk americana uh, like genre kind of it's starting right now to turn into something that might have been tolerable for me about mm-hmm. 10 years ago but um at this at some point i did give up on um being in that industry i just because i just didn't feel like it was not that i feel like that any part of the music industry is fair to like you know underrepresented groups but I think I was I felt like I, I ended up in a lot of situations I didn't want to be in you know <laughs> so, um and I didn't feel that safe so but at the same time you know I was just it started out I was just writing about where I was from and and um you know like I, if my grandpa one of my grandpas was a preacher and the other one worked on the railroad you know like it's, it's almost like I had to be a country singer you know um <laughs> for a while at least so, yeah, that's kind of how I came to it, and and I and I just decided, okay, I guess I identify as trans, and I'm playing country music, and then I was just stubborn, and I thought I'm just gonna go where everyone else goes. So I just toured where all of like the cis folks I knew toured who played country music, and and um, yeah, I think it was I don't know, it it was um it was really interesting, you know, but I think it's mm-hmm. something I might not do again now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. As as you said, it's it's no secret that um, you know there's safety concerns and risks involved, especially traveling in different pockets of the world um, and identifying as transgender. But in the context of, especially as a touring musician and being on the road, um, I know you you talk a lot about um, your experience performing and you know kind of less welcoming environments, maybe more conservative leaning areas uh, in Alberta and so on. Um, And kind of just an overall commentary on the traditionalism of country music per se. I really liked this quote you said in Shana's book about the gender and genre rules of the country music industry being strict. Um, But luckily by already breaking one set of rules, the audience who came to your shows seemed ready to let you break others. Um, Just sort of in retrospect, I know that wasn't in the last year, but what what does that sort of mean to you now in in 2021 or if you are gonna release more music and play uh, live again? Yeah, I mean, I think my transition (laughs) out of country music, um, it was actually really smooth and, and it wasn't like those people who had always been supporting me, like nobody was, you know, left, like because I was playing, you know, some had more drums or, you know, like um, that people were more open to change anyway, you know, like I think it's a, it's a great filter, you know, like um, being trans <laughs> or something like that to like filter out anybody who's going to have like, you know, like if they come to your show anyway and they know that you're trans, then there's usually like they're a little bit more open-minded to change, right? So you could change your music you could change your music too. And, and, um, yeah, but um, like I've, you know, granted I've always kind of, I've always stuck to the songwriter, like singer kind of, um, like format. So like, I'm still making songs, you know, I didn't go from like playing country songs to drone music, which is like an awesome genre, mm-hmm. but you know, like it wasn't like I flew so far from where it was, you know, still, I was, I mean, basically I just believe in songs as their own thing, you know, like the end that, you know, if you have a good song, doesn't matter what genre it is and you can record it in a bunch of different genres too um and so that's always the goal for me is to kind of just record songs that could transfer and like lean on and lean on the writing and, and the content of the songs for like for that to be you know the actual like um substance of what i'm doing you know so mm-hmm. um yeah 
I wanted to also, you know, bring up the importance of obviously you've been in the industry um, and you understand this, like the importance of relatability in music in, you know, connecting to your artist or sorry, to other artists, to your audiences, um, especially even from a marketing perspective. This is, I guess, more in a commercial, uh, commercial view. But, you know, ultimately, how will my art, my craft reach other people? Um, I wanted to emphasize your, you know, your signature use of humor in your songwriting and how this became part of your, your style and how it creates accessibility to listeners. You know, whether your audience may understand uh, the context of everything you're singing about or not, um, sort of creating this portal where you can hear a story being told. I was curious, how would you, how would you say your approach to songwriting has maybe evolved over the years? Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because I started kind of writing songs when I was like 10, 11 or 12, right? And I grew up like in a Pentecostal family, so and we weren't really allowed to listen to like secular music, right? So even like the other night I was out and a jazz band had like some sort of Beatles refrain in their music and someone recognized it. And I was like, yeah, I just, I don't immediately, like I had to teach myself all of the pop music like from the beginning, you know? Like, um, so um, yeah, so as far as like, yeah, sorry, I just totally got lost. Uh, can you ask me the question again? Uh, just sort of how you how you approach songwriting um, now from the start of your career, or I guess especially as the landscape changes and you know there's kind of more more awareness, but more of a, an actual scene community of queer and trans artists. Like how that sort of speaks to how you approach songwriting now. Yeah, I mean, I think in the beginning of my like in the early like records I wrote, I kind of wrote more like in the country music records. I think I would definitely write love songs and I would use the pronoun she because I mostly was dating women at the time. So it wasn't like I was hiding queerness if they thought maybe I was a woman or, you know, like there was definitely like, I wasn't like not putting gender into it or like the possibility of queerness. But yeah, it's interesting that like as the world is, it's not totally, I mean, there's a backlash we know against trans people happening right now all over. Um, Now that it's almost like, you know, the right wing parties have, people have kind of figured out the politicians have figured out they can use trans people as a flashpoint, like, like they use gay people, you know, um, and still do sometimes uh, to distract people. So, so it's like you have this different kind of, like, very focused discrimination happening right now. Um, but, like, as the world kind of, you know, as the scene kind of gets easier to be trans, um, it's becoming harder to be an artist, right? Like, with Spotify and, like, you know, what's happened with COVID and, and um, yeah, so just to even to tour or to relate to people, like, um yeah, so it's almost, I feel like, I don't know what I'm going to do, like, I've still, I've still stuck to, like, the album format, like, my last album, like, it was eight songs, so, um, mm-hmm. like, but I think I'm looking at, I'm looking, I mentor a lot of younger artists, I'm watching them do, they're like, I'm going to do one song, or I'm going to do three songs, and now, with, like, you know, the climate, but, like, who's going to buy, you know, to find that money for those songs, like, they're, they're never going to make the money back from making those songs, you know, unless they made, like, I don't I don't know, some people might make money back, but it's very, very rare now. So it's a lot harder than it used to be to get out mm-hmm. there. But, um, but I do think, like, what you said about relating is key and, and kind of taking it back from, like, I think Spotify is great. And, you know, I think it's great people can connect over the Internet, like, people all over the world. Um, but the very much, like, community, like, like local art matters a lot at the like, college radio and, you know, local art shows and connecting the people around you, you know, and, 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 I built my career on, like, that kind of grassroots um, thing. Like, I just kind of got stuff school in every town, like, in Canada and parts of, you know, parts of Europe. And, you know, people who ran those more, like, independent, you know, um, radio stations or, like, promoters. Um, there's still a system, of, like, a system out there of those folks. So, you know, the most solid art careers I've seen are, like, grassroots built because it, it can't be taken away by a label dropping you or a manager mm-hmm. dropping you, you know? So... Um, yeah, so I think for the future, I like, I definitely, I'm actually working on some like ambient music right now, hopefully with my voice and that'll be different. But, um, I think I, I think I'll just keep kind of going where the songs lead me, you know, like I've had a period, I kind of am coming through a period of, I've been sick for a couple of years and like dealing with a lot of health stuff. So, but I've also been writing about that. So I'll probably write, like I have an album's worth of stuff about about that kind of period, so 
yeah, for me, I feel like I can, because I can record at home, I can afford to make a whole album, you know, and like, it's free for me to record myself, you know, so, yeah, I think for relatability, like, I'm just going to continue, and, but then you can still have your single, right, so, if people mm-hmm. only want to hear your single, they can go to your single, and then some people, like, still want to find an album, you know, but I think the album format is going to, it's slowly disappearing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, there's a lot of changes, at least um, in the record industry, but it's nice to see changes in, you know, this this whole concept of like not fitting into one genre is so interesting because I feel like it opens up a lot of doors for new artists and it also kind of opens up a conversation for older artists to kind of look more critically at their own work, right? Like looking back at your discography and thinking, oh, okay, like maybe I could break out of this mold or how can I, how can I, you know, adapt and change and, and grow, right? I was just going to say, uh, I think a lot of people feel pressure once they have success um, to stay and just, and they feel pressure from their teams and the people around them to keep delivering like, oh, that was successful, keep delivering that over and over, right? And then the artist can get lost in that. Um, but like, if you're someone like me, who like I manage myself, I can go, I just want to make this, and I just want to make that. And, and that's kind of an, an advantage that I've always had is that, you know, because I didn't fit into like this slot, it was like the, the record labels didn't want anything to do with me or, you know, <laughs> so I could kind of just always do mm-hmm. whatever I wanted. But, you know, I think more people are starting to feel like that now, you know. Um, you know, the politics of choosing a, of a, choosing a genre um, or, you know, your identity being related to the type of music that you make. Um, I know you co-wrote uh, Gender Failure back in 2017. Um, and in it, you were talking about, I know it's a collection of, of stories and written pieces, how gender binaries fail everyone at some point. And I was, I was curious what you meant by that. I guess, you know, like, I, when I talk to folks, you know, over the, I've been talking to folks over the years, and a lot of, you know, or to my close friends who are maybe, like, cis males, female folks, you know, but, you know, when we talk about gender and, and their genders, you know, if you talk about growing up or something, there's always been a point with, you know, at some point, you know, some expectation comes up that's like a gender, like a sexist expectation, so, mm-hmm. kind of like sexism fails everybody, right, like, there's a, like a point where a boy doesn't want to fight or wants to cry. You know, like there's a point where, you know, like a girl wants to play hockey, you know, but, you know, so I'm more talking about that, like sexist, um, the sexism, right? Because I don't think that gender binary would even really exist in the same way without sexism, you know, like mm-hmm. sexism kind of is what reinforces the binary. Without sexism, there, there would be, okay, there's like, there still be some sort of like differentiation, I guess, like biologically according, you know, this is this kind and this is that kind according to certain measurements, which, you know, there is like, you know, for medically, and you know, there's rules about what is a female and what female anatomy and what's male anatomy, right? And then the way people are born like varies from that often. So, you know, and then they're like trying to decide which, which one they should make like the intersex baby, you know? So, so, but like, you know, I think without, without sexism socially, like, what would, what would the gender binary look like, you know? You know, you, you're able to mentor all these artists and, um, like, you are, I would say, like, a Canadian trailblazer for queer and trans artists, and that's so amazing. Um, but it doesn't come, come with, you know, the hardship that you obviously faced to get to the place where you are, and you know, what would you say is a common misconception people have about uh, about being an open transgender artist in the industry, like, I guess, in present day? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I identify as transgender and non-binary. Um, and I think something really cool that's happened in the last five years is a lot of people have been coming out as non-binary as well, not necessarily transgender. So, and I thought I read a study, like, in the, there was a study in the States, and I can find it if you need me too bad. I think it's like for Gen Z, they did like a, a poll somewhere and it was like 49% of the youth um, identified as like not not straight, so like not straight or cis. Like they were, there was some sort of variance that were either like queer or non-binary or so like, mm-hmm. I feel like there's like this big sort of like, I think there's a big change happening with that. So like the 
non-binary and transgender thing. Like, I think, you know, you can, it's complicated to think about them and everybody has their own alignment. But yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the misconception, people most often, the question people have most often asked me is, like, is it getting better for transgender people? And I think that the misconception is that there's like one kind of transgender people, you know? I, you know, I'm just, I'm so focused, I'm focused on it's not better till it's better for everyone. So even though we have, you know, the, you know, gender um, expression or gender identity in the Charter of Rights in Canada, like, how far does that, that doesn't help me when I go to the hospital. And then also there's people who have, you know, like I'm white and, you know, um, so I have all of this privilege. Uh, and so until it's like, for people who don't have like a Canadian passport in or a can- and in Canada and transgender, for people who mm-hmm. do that who are transgender, you know, like for people of color, uh, for indigenous people who are transgender, like until that changes, you know. And then my other point of it, is it getting better for people is like if I was born into the same family that I had, you know, in the 80s, like it would be the same for me, you know. Like if I grew up, <laughs> like growing up Pentecostal now, I'm sure that it's exactly the, as difficult as, you know it was for me. So yeah, Mm -hmm. I think just kind of the kind of boiling it down to like, like nobody can answer that question. And, and I guess it's just like a nice springboard to like remind it like myself and everyone to, we need to like look at more than just, it's not, it's not like a one side, it's like a one issue thing, you know? Um, Yeah. Yeah. So. I know like a big theme when uh, Shana was working with you was just talking about even the um, similarities between the words gender and genre and how these are becoming more fluid. Um, And just her talking about how this is a consideration now in new artists too, which I think is a really, really cool movement. Um, We're slowly moving away from constructs that are, you know, excluding and frankly archaic at this point you know there's a couple things in the music industry i think we could probably start reconsidering um so it's just interesting how you know art should be celebrating differences and sort of transcend all these rigid models of thinking and you know it's 2021 where are we finally having that discussion um people who run the industry like once they figure out it's about making money right so once the banks mm-hmm. figured out that gay people had money, all of a sudden they were all over pride, right? So it's the same thing. Like as soon as, you know, um, whoever these folks are who have the money in like the higher up, you know, the more more moneyed area of the music industry, like they are figuring out that they can make money. And so that's the, that's the funny thing is like, I think that it will be like the commercialization of it too, you know, once it improves to a certain point. But I like, mm-hmm. I, I just, for young artists, like I just hope they, like the sky's the limit. Like I hope they all, you know, get to, you know, do as well as possible. And if they end up, you know, in that light of, like part of the industry and that's what they want, then that would be really awesome, you know? So, and I'm happy to have just like, you know, for me, that's not going to happen. I think it's just like, it's like the timing thing of like your age, right? You're just like, I'm like, okay, I'm like 40. So like these, if these folks in this generation can, you know, if that can be a non-issue or maybe an issue that's like even something that people are excited about, that's a non-binary great you know and yeah and the, the genre thing I think yeah I think people in the last you know I don't, I don't think most people care that much about genre anymore you know like I only listen to folk music or I guess there's probably some people who do that but yeah I, I think it's more common for people I know that like you've listened to like lots of different kinds of music you know so it's, I think that is really nice too um yeah just I love festivals that are a huge thanks again goes out to Shanna Golden Pershbacher and Ray Spoon for joining us and sharing their stories. You can find Shana's book Queer Country on shelves in February of 2022. And you can check out the show notes for a promo code for 30% off your purchase of Queer Country from the University of Illinois Press. This program was produced by Craig Clemens, Regan McDonnell, and myself. Graphics by Andre Grant. 
I'm your host, Laura McInnes Ray. If you enjoyed the show or have a project you'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear from you at podcasts at rxmusic.com. You've been listening to Beneath the Rhythm, an RX Music podcast. Thank you.